morning, everyone. Welcome to the UBC Learning Circle. We are pleased to be joined in circle today by Ali Dick, Marion Erickson, Katina Pollard, Dr. Terry Aldred, and Dr. Shona Mitchell Foster. Together, we're all going to be chatting a little bit about HPV self collection projects in, in Northern BC, um, in you know towards the collective goal of trying to put um, cervix health in the hands of our Indigenous communities in the north. Um, so before I get into anything else, I would like to acknowledge that I'm zooming in from the traditional ancestral unceded and occupied territories of the Hunkamenum speaking Musqueam people. I would also like to acknowledge the First Nations Health Authority for generously funding the UBC Learning Circle. So uh, a gentle reminder here, the topics we cover can sometimes be sensitive or emotionally triggering. Please make sure that you're looking after yourself. If at any point you feel that you need to talk to a friend, elder, counselor, or family member, please don't hesitate to do so. Make sure you're accessing that support network if needed. So introductions. Uh, my name is Cole, I'm from the Chelwethal First Nation. I'll be facilitating the session today. So we'll be learning alongside all of you uh, from these wonderful, powerful women here today. I'm um, sharing our digital space, but off camera is uh, Cynthia, our production coordinator. If you feel so inclined, please introduce yourselves in the chat box and we'll, uh, we'll get started. And with that, I'll pass the mic over to Ali. Great, thanks. Uh, we'll just start with uh, some introductions. So my name is Ali Dick. I am joining today from the traditional unceded and occupied uh, territories of the Wet'suwet'en Nation. Um, since 2019, I have been a project assistant supporting two of the three um, HPV self-collection projects in the North that we'll be sharing about today. Um, so happy to be here and excited to be sharing about this. Um, and I will pass it over to Katina to introduce herself. Atanji and good morning, everyone. Um, first off, I just want to thank Cole and the entire UBC Learning Circle uh, for giving us the opportunity to opportunity to present on this very important topic today. Um, we're also passionate about uh, cervical cancer screening, so we're really looking forward to answering your questions and comments uh, throughout the morning. Uh, so Dashika Sean, Katina Pollard. My name is Katina Pollard and I am the HPV self-collection project assistant with Métis Nation BC. Um, I'm a proud community member of the Thompson Okanagan Métis Association, which is located in Kamloops, BC. And I'm calling in today from the traditional territories of the Deniza Treaty 8 First Nations communities, which is also home of the Kelly Lake Métis Settlement Society. Thank you. And I'll pass it over to Shona. I'll, I'll just let Marianne go first there. Hadi Huna Steve was Dil, Marianne Lay Suzy, Sitli was T. Hi, my name is uh, Marianne. Um, I'm glad you're all here today. And um, I live in Sitli uh, KO, um, which is part of the Dakath Nation. I'm from uh, Nat Gisley. Um, and uh, I am a master's student at TRU, um, as well as a research manager at the Health Arts Research Center. Um, maybe I'll pass it to Shiona. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, my, uh, my name is Shona Mitchell Foster, and I'm a, a sixth generation uh, white uh, settler um, from Treaty, uh, Treaty 6 territory. And um, I, I wasn't born in um, Canada. I was born on the territory of the Rurigancho people um, in what you might know as um, Lima in Peru. Um, and today I'm, I'm speaking to you from uh, the traditional and unceded territories of the uh, Clayton Tene, uh, where I live and work. And I'll hand it over to Terry. Hadi, good morning. My name is Terry Aldred. I'm Dekath from Klausden, a member of the Silly the Frog Clan. On my mom's side and on my dad's side, I'm a tea Cree and mixed European, and I'm also calling in today from the Clay Lake Today traditional territory, otherwise known as Prince George. Um, and I'm a family doc by trade, um, and in uh, this circle today, as um, as one of the physicians who helped to um, facilitate the uh, 
handing out the HPV kits, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, and I'm really happy to be here. Great. So with that, we'll get this presentation and the slides pulled up. Great. So today we're going to be uh, sharing about our um, yeah, set basically kind of three uh, three projects uh, across the north. Um, next slide, please. And we've uh, talked about where uh, the territories that we're each calling in from, and uh, these projects um, were were done on both First Nations traditional and unceded territories, as well as among chartered Métis communities. Um, and certainly, without um, their welcome, uh, this work would not uh, not at all uh, be possible. Uh, next slide. And the the place where we're starting uh, to to give you the the background or the bigger picture of this project is uh, why we chose um, the north uh, and why um, we're we're focused on uh, First Nations and Métis uh, women and people with a cervix and. Um, part of this um, really goes into the discussions of um, who, who is most impacted by um, uh, cervical cancer in our province. Next slide. And uh, in the north, um, as you saw from our picture there, we, uh, we have spectacular but vast geographies and uh, this in and of itself, um, folks who live in rural and remote settings. Uh, can act as a uh, as a barrier for um, engaging in care, um, but there's also um, many personal reasons, um, including um, uh, trauma, financial status, not able to get child care. Uh, we have health system capacity issues, uh, so just not having the human resources uh, to be able to provide um, uh, screening options to to everyone. And uh, from the data that, uh, that we know of, so um, FNHA and BC Cancer um, did a, a review a few years ago, uh, looking at uh, rates of all different kinds of cancers provincially, um, and specifically around cervical cancer found a 92% higher rate of, of cervical cancer among First Nations women. And we know much less about cervical cancer rates among, among uh, Métis communities as well. So we were keen to um, throw our, um, you know, cast the net as wide as, wide as we could um, and very much focus on uh, culturally safe options and ways that we could um, give um, people more control uh, of the options for screening. And I'll start with a, a brief, um, a few brief uh, comments on cervical cancer and, and how we screen. And one of the very unique parts about uh, cervical cancer um, is it, that it is the only cancer in the world that we have a vaccine for. Uh, next slide, please. And um, this is an incredibly safe uh, vaccine and it's highly effective. Um, and uh, this is why we, we offer it to um, all um, kids of all genders in, uh, in grade six. Uh, but obviously also um, you can get it later, um, later as well. Um, next slide. So uh, cervical cancer, we, we know the cause. Uh, it's caused by a virus called the human papillomavirus, incredibly common. Um, and although most people clear uh, the virus um, within a couple of years. If that's persistent, then it does cause abnormal cells that are like a precancer, and if the, those can develop if not treated. Next slide. So that's why um, we also have some very effective options for cervical cancer screening. So not only do we have the vaccine, um, but we're actually able to, to screen really effectively um, prior to there being any invasion um, of those cancer cells. And uh, currently in uh, British Columbia, the standard of care is with pap smears. So that is, um, takes a, a kind of a scraping of cells from the cervix. It does require a pelvic examination. And it does require quite a bit of, of um, infrastructure in terms of, of uh, the lab as well. Uh, next slide. Because we know that 
the abnormal cells that we de detect on PAPs are actually caused by HPV. The other option that we have um, for cervical cancer screening is actually using HPV to screen. So we test for HPV DNA. And the unique part of this option for screening is that yes, it can be collected by um, a clinician with a pelvic exam, but it also gives us the option of offering self-screening. Um, and the, um, uh, the clinician versus a self-screen um, do have a really high correlation. Um, so this is a, a very effective uh, options for screening. Next slide. So currently um, in British Columbia, so we do have, uh, you know, we have these options for screening. And even, you know, prior to the pandemic, we, we failed to get even to 70% um, of women and people with a cervix um, accessing or uh, being able to, to engage with, uh, with pap screening. Obviously for many reasons, uh, many of which I have, uh, you know, touched on previously. And uh, we know that that's a, a very significant risk for uh, the development of invasive cervical cancer as well. And our goal with all of these projects is to um, use these innovative options to be able to offer women um, a lot more control over how they screen and where they screen. Next slide. This uh, image really uh, tells a lot um, about uh, the, the current state of, of cervical cancer screening in, um, in BC. And uh, we're, we're talking about pandemic proof screening today. And uh, what we found, um, so this is uh, data from the um, provincial screening program. So when we had uh, lockdown in, in 2020 in um, March there, you can see um, the number of PAPs being done obviously uh, dropped exponentially. Um, and that slowly increased and then has gone down again uh, this year as well. And currently, provincially, we're um, estimating that there's about 100,000 uh, PAPs that are overdue. So this is in addition to underscreened women that we may not uh, know about, uh, but women who kind of were due during the, the past year, year and a half. Um, and this has really created more of an impetus uh, for, for um, being uh, able to, to focus more on maybe some more innovative, uh, innovative options for screening. Next slide. And um, the, the folks that we're um, focusing on um, are underscreened women. So uh, more and more <laughs> are becoming underscreened um, all the time. Um, there is um, an age criteria um, as well. And the you know, three uh, projects that you'll be hearing about all have slightly uh, different ways of engaging and, and where and how they offer, um, offer the, um, the option of self-screening. Next slide. Um, so there are uh, a lot of different uh, partners um, on board here um, and funding is from uh, the CIHR at a federal level, um, as well as from a private uh, foundation. Um, and um, you're going to hear some more details about all of these projects. Um, but first, I want to hand it over to, um, to Marianne, who has been an incredible uh, partner and given us a, um, a very unique perspective on uh, the experience at that, at that interface um, with screening and, and treatment. Um, so I'll get the, the next slide and hand it over to, uh, to Marianne. Everyone. Um, so again, my name is Marion. Um, thanks for the introduction, Shiona. Um, so I sent along a puzzle piece that should have come in with your um, event um, package. Um, so um, I just thought I'd give a little bit of a background. So at the Health Arts Research Center um, at UNBC is where I work as a research manager. And a part of my job is um, dealing with a lot of the um, anti-Indigenous racism in healthcare. And um, we do that in, in a large way through the arts. So um, one of the things that I know from sitting in a lot of Zoom meetings uh, throughout this pandemic is um, that you 
there's a lot of missed opportunities to um, engage in in art um, in and engage without just watching and just sitting there. So if you're just sitting there, please take out your puzzle piece. Um, and I just want to ask people um, during this session, if you can just think about how this session, um, how what you're learning today um, will enable you if you are in the health um, and caring positions, um, how, how you fit into your community's uh, holistic health. Um, and I'm hoping that you can um, just reflect on that while you're while you're learning today and um, take a picture of it and send it back to the um, event organizers um, so that I can put it together into one big puzzle piece. Um, and I'm just hoping that um, that yeah, there that um, that people can take away from this um, the research, but also, um, think about uh, what what uh, exactly is going on in healthcare, and and one of the things with regards to screening is is um, the intergenerational uh, trauma and also the racism that Indigenous women um, the that Indigenous women experience in healthcare. I think there's a lot of uh, hesitancy. Uh, I know when I first met Dr. Shiona Mitchell. Foster, I was actually, I didn't really have much trust for her um, when she told me that I needed to have a LEAP procedure. Um, I thought that she was trying to sterilize me and that this was just way overboard. I don't need this kind of thing. Like, um, and, it, and it really, what it had to do with was the stories that I was told as a, as a young um, person growing up being a woman, I was told that, um, I was told many stories of people being sterilized, um, men and women in the North. Um, and so my reaction to not getting screened and, and not following up with the leap for the first time was, was, a, was a response to racism. It was a, it was a self-preservation um, that, that I had in, inherited from those who are not much older than me, who have experienced a atrocities and genocide within the healthcare system. Um, one of the things that I said on the, on the uh, FNHA promotional video had to do with regards to the UN definition of, of genocide. And that definition of genocide includes implementing measures to prevent births. And that's something that's happened to Indigenous people in Canada. Um, and, and it's something that's currently being um, investigated and things like that today. So um, the, the, um, the work that Dr. Shiona Mitchell Foster is doing, I think is so important, um, especially with the self-screening. Um, I thought that they were, I, I didn't know that they were screening for HPV <laughs> until this presentation. I thought it was the same thing as a PAP. So that's very informative, I'm really glad. Um, and uh, and um, yeah, um, I'm just, uh, oh, I just wanted to kind of touch on a little bit of history in Northern BC. So one of the things that I found out was with regards to, um, was with regards to my own indigenous language. So I've been working to revitalize my language. Um, uh, my introduction, as you heard, I kind of stumbled a bit. I've only been, uh, able to introduce myself in DAVCAS for I think the past four months um, without having to look at cheat cards. <laughs> but uh, so then I started looking into the the, the uh, understanding the the female body and anatomy. Um, and um, so what I found was that settlers began working towards colonizing DACAS women's bodies prior to residential school. Um, and it be began with the missionaries in the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, there was a missionary by the name of Father Adrian Gabriel Maurice. For those of you who don't know, um, the town of Morristown was named after him, but then they changed to Whitsett. Um, so the formerly uh, town of Morristown um, was named after him. Anyways, um, he actually did a quite, quite a bit of uh, work in our language, I found out. So um, 
the uh, the in the Saika's dialect, um, the the word for menstruation was saga nada, which uh, means sick from the moon. Um, but uh, what my friend Dr. Bill Poser kind of explained was that there was actually an older word uh, for that, but it was replaced um, in in the um, at the time that I stated. Um, and the older word is me nas li, um, and it means that she is sacred and powerful periodically. Um, so I, I was actually really, um, well, obviously very angered by that, but I also found that there was quite a, there, there's a lot of different um, words that were developed um, in our language um, by the missionaries. Um, to, to describe women's bodies. So for instance, in the Daketh language, um, I, said, I mean, in the Nakazi dialect, there's a word that means between the breasts and the, and your vagina uh, or, and your, um, and that area, they decided to just name it all one thing. So that whole area, they called it my shame. And I thought that that was the, the, uh, the <laughs> strangest, not strangest, but for me, as not as not being Catholic, I found it very strange um, that there was these words developed, but it's actually been a part of the colonization of Indigenous women's bodies. And I think that um, since I've been talking about this for, for a while now, um, I still do find that a lot of people get uncomfortable when I talk about um, the female anatomy using the correct words, um, because uh, in my in my indigenous language, sometimes people feel very uncomfortable um, saying the words. So they'll say things like "ee" -e <laughs> instead of saying the the, the real words. So I think that um, when dealing with with this really um, really sensitive uh, subject, I think that there's there's a lot that that uh, a lot of history that can be overcome as well. Um, so I'm really glad for this work and I'm really um, looking forward to a lot of the really good results um, from this research because um, Indigenous women uh, really need um, a lot of support because a lot of times we don't think about our own health. We're so, we, we're matrilineal, so we take care of our whole family. And that was another thing is somebody said, you know, you take care of everybody. You should really take care of yourself sometimes. And so I'm hoping that with this presentation, um, a lot of people take a look at the stats and think to yourself, maybe I need to go in and get screened uh, as well. So um, I think this work is really important. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, Marian, for sharing your story. Uh, your voice is just so powerful and I know it's making a positive uh, impact with our youth and our communities in the North. So thank you. Um, so, uh, hello again, my name is Katina Pollard. Um, my presentation today is going to be on Métis Nation's HPV self-collection project. Um, I'm going to speak a bit to Métis Nation's history, then progress into how the project started, came to be, and then I'll finish with some Q&A. Uh, next slide, please. So Métis are one of the distinct, uh, three distinct Indigenous peoples in Canada. And in just over a short period of time, developed a distinct society with its own stories, culture, and traditions. Um, these were generally taught by our grandmothers, grandfathers, and ancestors. Um, the Métis Nation arose from association with the fur trade. Uh, so Métis people were born into the fur trade and worked a variety of occupations. Uh, their paternal ancestry was drawn from French, Scottish, and English, while their maternal ancestry came from primarily Cree, Dene, Soto, Anishabe, and Assiniboine women. Um, so although the first generation were born to Caucasian and First Nation parents, uh, subsequent generations of Métis people intermarried with one another, forming their own separate community. Next slide, please. I'll just continue on. <laughs> uh, so in BC, we have uh, over 90,000 people who identify as Métis, and of that, over 22,000 are citizens of Métis Nation. 
Um, so Meiji Nation is comprised of seven elected regional directors. Uh, we do have an elected representative of Meiji Women of British Columbia, as well as an elected representative of Meiji Youth British Columbia, and then our president and vice president. Uh, so Métis Nation's mandate is to develop and enhance opportunities for uh, Métis communities by implementing culturally relevant social and economic programs and services. Um, and we do represent 38 Métis chartered communities in British Columbia, um, which are also actually comprised of presidents, vice presidents, and board members. So Métis communities, uh, chartered communities, are the basic unit of the Métis government and they are the voices for Métis people in the province of BC. Um, our community leaders and champions have played a vital role in having our HPV self-collection project roll out uh, in the Northwest. So as far as additional background, one of the reasons we wanted to focus on Métis individuals uh, was to offer this option for screening and have them decide when and where they screen. We know there are many, many barriers to accessing healthcare services in the North, uh, but as well as accessing culturally safe care. So the unique part of Métis Nation's project is that it's primarily online with a few pickup options in each community um, that provides a safe space to register, collect, and then um, they actually send the kit back to the lab. Uh, so all of these options have helped alleviate some of those barriers that we've discussed, um, including timely access to care, access to a computer even, and of course the vast geographies in the North. So we know there are little, there is very little data. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> uh, we, we know there's very little data and a large gap related to Métis health and especially uh, with reproductive screening. So although we're so excited to have access to this data, we're more excited uh, to screen as many Métis individuals as possible uh, who may not otherwise have culturally appropriate um, access to these services. So to take you on a bit of a short timeline, <laughs> the project originally got started through conversations um, many, many years ago uh, between Miti Nation, uh, the HPV research team, and uh, the self-collection team. So I was hired on in 2019, and that's when our community engagement really began. So because community's voice uh, with Miti Nation is so important in all of our work, it's extremely important to engage with those key champions um, who have been really vital in making our project move forward. Uh, so through 2020, much of the focus included uh, training these community champions, our project physicians and, and their MOAs, as well as looking at ways to promote the project through our external partners. So because of the great work uh, from our team, we were able to launch the project um, in Smithers and Terrace in October of 2020, and then followed, Prince Rupert followed in uh, January of 2021. Next slide, please. So this slide is really a key component when working uh, with our communities, is um, how we really engage with them. So uh, historically, MMBC's way of contact has been through direct mail or through the Moccasin Telegraph, uh, which is uh, by word of mouth. Uh, we, so we've also been utilizing our online platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, we've also had opportunity to highlight the project in an article in the Terra Standard. And then recently Shona uh, has done an interview with the APTN TV network as well, Marion was involved with that too. <laughs> uh, so I think the biggest learning through all of this has been engaging with our community and ensuring that we're adapting our, um, their ideas to what works best for them for the project. Next slide, please. Great, so because our project is primarily online, I just wanted to highlight and show the cervix check website um, and quickly just run through the registration process. Uh, so in order to register, you do need a valid email address along with a unique code that we do provide. Um, so a participant can request a code from myself or the cervix check team. And then once they're registered, uh, we'll need to verify their eligibility. Um, and then after that, we will uh, mail them a kit, which includes a lab rack device and the instruction manual. 
Uh, so once the participant has collected, they will return their device in a prepaid kit provided by uh, our team and await results. Next slide, please. So we've certainly had to adapt to the way we engage with our community due to uh, COVID-19. Uh, so generally in our METI culture, gatherings are very, very important. Um, so although we would have loved to be promoting this in person while having a yummy feast, uh, we've still been able to engage with the community um, in a great way uh, by switching to online engagements. So a few of these photos were outcomes from our most recent engagement, which was a beating workshop. Um, and we're just really looking forward to our future engagements and uh, just feel extremely fortunate that we're still able to connect with community this way. Um, so glad to say our next engagement is scheduled in June and we're gonna be actually having a paint night. <laughs> next slide, please. Great, so uh, this photo is actually two of our amazing community champions in the Northwest. It's our regional director, Susie Hooper and her daughter, Alicia. Um, they both have gone above and beyond to support this project and we're just so thankful for their continued support. Um, and I'll just end with that this project has been so exciting for Métis Nation BC and Métis people in the Northwest. Uh, we've received nothing but positive feedback from community and participants of the project. Our Minister of Health, Paulette Plamond, and Senior Director Tanya Davern and myself are just so honoured to have the opportunity to work with this truly great team and provide this culturally safe option to screen for cervical cancer. So, merci and thank you. Awesome. Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, Miriam, thank you so much for sharing your your story here and Katina, thank you so much for, for the information um, that you've highlighted here on the Métis Nation and their participation in the, um, in the self-screening. We do have a couple of questions um, that have come up in the chat box over the course of, of this earlier presentation. So I'm gonna jump right into them. Um, one of the first ones that we have here, it just came in most recently, so it's the top of my list. Um, we've chatted a little bit or a lot or rather a lot about this, um, the gap in data as it were, or gap in information on Métis women or, or Métis people with the cervix and, um, cervical cancer screening rates and, uh, and, um, all that sort of, those sort of pieces. So the, one of the questions that came in was, what do you think are some of the reasons behind that gap specifically for, um, uh, Métis people with a cervix? Could it be an issue of self-identification um, or a combination of other factors? What are your thoughts, Katina? Um, so I do believe that um, a lot of it is to do with access in the North, um, just timely access, lack of um, healthcare providers in the area. Um, certainly COVID has impacted um, that as well. Um, I will pass this over to Shona. She may have more to add. <laughs> yeah, uh, many, many, many factors contributing. Um, one of the things provincially trying to find that, that data is, you know, certainly around the um, who, who identifies as uh, Métis versus who is actually a, a registered citizen of, of uh, Métis Nation BC. Um, and when we, um, when we look at our um, kind of uh, provincial databases, that, that information isn't, isn't always captured. Um, and as, as Katina alluded to, those, uh, those uh, questions of self-identification uh, can be really quite, quite complex as well and, and imp impacted by our fairly um, dark, dark history of colonialism as well. Um, the, some of the really exciting projects that, that um, Métis Nation has been doing um, with uh, I'm sure many populations within Métis Nation B BC, but the ones I know about are, are related to women's health um, and uh, doing surveys that are uh, reflecting a huge amount of, of information about, um, about uh, their citizens. And uh, so certainly it's moving in, in, um, in exciting directions and definitely a reason why we wanted to make sure that we partnered with Métis Nation BC for some of these projects. Awesome. 
Yeah, thanks very much for that response. Of course, questions of access are, are always going to be pivotal. I think, and again, this is speaking from a relatively limited kind of perspective here in my own, but, you know, it seems to me, you know, that as is the case for all Indigenous people, self-identification, particularly in a space where there could be a lot of power dynamics at play, right, in the context of going in and getting a, a, a screening done, um, self-identification is difficult. And I think within the context of our, of our current kind of colonial reality, uh, a lot of the time um, for Métis people in particular, it could be difficult. You know, there, there are conversations and questions around self-identification all the time. Um, and as you alluded to, Dr. Dr. Mitchell Foster, exactly the, the dark history cannot, can't help that. So um, I appreciate that response. Thanks guys. Um, we have another question here. Um, this one comes from, from a community member uh, specifically. They wanted to know a little bit about the self-screening itself um, and whether or not, in your opinion, if there was any pain associated with the, the self-screening. Um, if you guys had any any personal or or you know relevant uh, information to pass on there. Yeah, so the device is actually designed to be uh, pain free. Um, it is, you know, just to add context to it, it is a, a small device about the size of uh, size of your hand, um, and it does have a bristle at the end, which is very, very soft. Um, happy to provide more information on um, the device itself and uh, maybe send a photo. Uh, there is on our website, there are photos as well. Uh, but if a community member is interested, they can contact me. Um, I will provide my information and I'm happy to discuss that more. Awesome. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, so it's a, it's a really, um, it's, it's very kind of soft and bendy. And when we did, you know, historically did it, our in-person sessions, we'd, you know, pass one around and they'd be able to kind of look at it and, and, um, and touch it. So um, certainly not, not something that's, um, that's uncomfortable at all, uncomfortable at all and, and very straightforward to use. Awesome. Thank you both very much. I just wanted to highlight Dr. Aldred's comments in the, in the chat box there that not collecting good data is a way to disguise health inequities because it hides the scope of the problem. And absolutely, I think that's, a lot of what we're, we're chatting about. Thank you very much, Dr. Aldred, for that comment. Um, so I have one more question here quickly. Um, is self-screening available in other provinces and territories? I think we have a few individuals that are joining from outside of BC today. Can you guys provide any context as to whether or not a, a, this product or a similar project is being launched with other Indigenous communities across the, across the country? Yeah, so it, um, uh, currently they're, they're... Um, our other um, pilot project with uh, with self screening, um, but um, these these projects in BC are, are fairly unique as far as the the approach that we're using. Uh, but there have been some um, his, um, previous several years ago um, some self screening projects done in in northern Ontario specifically, uh, again with a, a focus on. Um, uh, First Nations populations. So absolutely, it's something that um, we're we're optimistic about. Um, you know, moving forward and and being available on a much uh, much wider level. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Um, I think we can kind of proceed forward with the the PowerPoint, and um, we'll save some of these other questions for a little later on. Thanks, guys. Sounds great. Thank you. <laughs> So we will now be switching gears and introducing a second HPV self-collection project based out of Northern Interior, British Columbia that works in partnership with Carrier Sikani Family Services. So Carrier Sikani Family Services is a health and wellness organization providing culturally safe services to 11 Carrier and Sikani member nations. They offer comprehensive and diverse services within community health centers. Ooh, that interruption. <laughs> um, they offer comprehensive and diverse uh, services within community health centers and um, have a great team of health and wellness workers. So here we have a map showing, <clears throat> excuse me, the approximate location of nine health centers currently providing self collection kits. So eight out of the nine partner health centers are based in rural or remote locations. 
Um, the Ninth Health Center is located in Prince George and um, services urban or transient Cary Sakan members. Uh, so to outline this project's timeline, in 2017, discussions and partnerships around this project were started. And these discussions included Carrier Sikani Family Services uh, research team, as well as their board of directors, uh, community members, health staff, and the HPV self-collection project team. These discussions were centered around getting feedback on project process, um, identifying ways to reach out to community members, outlining the best language to use on project materials, and more. In February 2019, the project was launched into eight community health centers, uh, and we received immediate interest from people wanting to participate. And then in March 2020, the project saw some changes due to COVID-19, um, and as a result of the temporary closure of some health centers and in-person services, um, we put a pause on the self-collection. Uh, but shortly after, following some discussions with our community partners, it was decided that self-collection kits could be offered again, considering they can be accessed um, even with physical distancing in mind. And then in January 2021, uh, the ninth health center was added, which is the one in Prince George, um, which has the goal of offering the service to carrier and Sakani members who live off reserve or who are transient. So to situate you and identify where these projects take place within the province, we wanted to share this picture outlining Carrier Sakani traditional territory. Um, and we also have a list of the nine participating health centers. Um, and I really want to, want to emphasize that these health centers have been crucial spaces for the success of this project because the majority of them can be accessed by foot from people's homes or through a short drive, uh, or in some cases through a short snowmobile right away. Um, they're safe and welcoming environments and spaces that host cultural events, lunches, and other gatherings for all community members. So Carrier Sakani as an organization is unique in that they prioritize research and wellness work in response to community identified needs. So community members and health staff recognize that there was a need for alternative options to cervical cancer screening and that there were barriers to accessing pop tests. So in order to respond to community identified needs, Carrier Sakani Family Services developed um, a process where uh, many voices can come together and engage in conversations around projects, ideas, or ways to address these community needs. Um, so this process is centered around listening and taking a community-based research approach. And this is how we move forward with the self-collection project back in uh, 2017 and is how conversations continue to this day. Um, so this project was developed through the involvement of many people around the table. So the Carrier Sakani Family Service Research Advisory Board and Board of Directors, health and wellness staff, elders and knowledge keepers, community members, and more. Um, this process allows for diversity in perspectives and thoughtful approaches to be developed. Um, the topic of introducing a self-collection option was welcomed with enthusiasm and our team is, is so grateful for the many voices and contributions to the development and implementation of this project. So here we have a graph. Um, so this is a visual to demonstrate the different recruitment approaches that were taken in different communities to engage uh, both health staff and community members and help spread awareness about this cervical cancer screening alternative. So each community is slightly unique um, and has some variety in how recruitment approaches were used. In all of the communities, we have a number of different health providers um, that are involved and we've taken different approaches for engagement. Um, some of these approaches include organizing in community meetings with health staff and community members, working with uh, community champions, attending health and wellness days and health fairs, as well as distributing materials, which include monthly newsletters, uh, project posters, and invitation letters. So community engagement is a key component to this project's success. Um, similar to the Métis Nation BC project, prior to COVID-19, our team would travel uh, into communities to host lunches, attend health fairs, set up display tables, and have in-person conversations with people. Uh, but due to COVID, we made a switch to a virtual approach for engagement, which includes um, developing content for newsletters that get distributed monthly to 
uh, health staff, as well as developing content for the Guzi newsletter, which is this beautiful newsletter that's put together four times a year by the Curiosity County communications team. Um, and it's printed and circulated in communities. So the ongoing success of this project, despite the pause in in-person visits has been the support from community health staff uh, and community champions who have continued to advocate for this work and share information with their networks. And we found that promotion through word of mouth uh, within social networks has been a, a really key piece to informing people of this opportunity. Our approach for community engagement prior to COVID-19 and now is based off an understanding that there is a digital divide that exists within these communities. So it's not uncommon to hear of restricted access to cell service or broadband internet um, and community members may have limited access to laptops or smartphones. So with this consideration, engagements are centered around in-person sessions or th through offering uh, printed materials such as the posters and newsletters. And so far, this approach has worked really well, um, largely because of the integrated health teams and community champions sharing information, as well as the existing health center infrastructure that people can go into uh, to find our project information. And I would now like to pass things over to Dr. Terry Aldred to speak to her experiences as a physician with Carrier Sikani. Thanks, Ali. So I've been working with Carrier Sikani Family Services. I will be eight years in August. Uh, and I've known I was the first resident that went up with Dr. John Palovich, who um, uh, was a pioneer for the primary care team um, a few years before I started. Um, and so for me, uh, it was definitely coming full circle um, to be able to come back and serve communities within my traditional territory. Um, and yeah, and now is um, my main focus of clinical work um, as I balance it out with my roles with FNHA and the Rural Coordination Center and UBC. Um, so I would just like to start with just talking about my um, sharing a little bit about my passion for women's health. It's always been something that I've really enjoyed uh, because of the teaching aspect and um, the opportunity for prevention, um, as well as to review the consent process, both for uh, medical visits, but also just in general, uh, and to try to help empower women um, to be, um, to reclaim their power over their bodies. Um, and so that part is really, really important to me. Um, in my work serving communities, I've had many different responses um, to pap screening or um, breast exams and, and different things from people, you know, telling me to shut up and just get it over with to, um, you know, to people, you know, really wanting to ask questions and, and to learn more. Um, and, you know, um, learned uh, some of the impacts of colonization um, and learned some new things from Marion today, um, just about the, the legacy. And what I've seen is that there was a lot of shame about people, about their bodies. People would come in legitimately, like just out of the shower for their tests because they felt um, they needed to do that. They were very anxious about, you know, how they pr would present or, um, you know, any judgments and, and things like that. Um, and um, some of the CHRs would tell me that, you know, especially women after they got married would stop coming in for exams because, you know, they were told by the church that nobody but their husbands can touch them down there, including themselves. Um, and so um, just trying to combat some of those um, yeah, some of those, uh, for from my perspective, harmful um, uh, teachings that um, that that women took on. Um, and for me, uh, in my belief system, um, that that's not um, that's not generally how matriar matriarchal people are. Um, you know, we are women's bodies are gifts. We're tied to the land. We're able to um, give and sustain life. Um, and so, for me, um, I just feel really passionate about teaching women about um, you know what a blessing they are and what a blessing their bodies are and um, the gifts of, of their natural cycles, as well as educating about how things can sometimes 
um, go wrong, uh, for lack of a better way of saying it, or, you know, um, things that we can do to help if people are having difficult uh, periods or difficult pregnancies or difficulties with menopause um, and trying to change that pathol pathologic, uh, patho no, <laughs> trying to verb uh, change that into a verb, essentially trying to change um, the onus from um, pathologizing our bodies. There we go. Um, and um, so, so this work is really important to me. Um, and just honoring the fact that um, in addition to the colonial, um, you know, uh, effects um, that have induced a lot of shame, um, there's also a lot of intergenerational trauma um, and personal trauma that people have that can affect, you know, um, their responses to um, coming in for really um, sensitive and um, sometimes uncomfortable exams. And so um, with that, I think it's really important to give people choice um, and that and to empower people to um, to make those the decisions that are right for them and their bodies. <clears throat> um, and so with this, I, I do feel that it, it gives women another option um, that uh, that can help to screen because oftentimes women are very anxious about this. They do want to, um, they do want to know, they do want to make sure that they're okay. Um, and so, um, but sometimes having, uh, you know, an invasive exam is just something that's not, um, that's not open to them. They just can't do it. And uh, so to me that that's really important. Also, it kind of de-emphasizes um, the physician as the one that needs to do this, um, which sometimes some of our communities don't have a lot of access to physician services. And so, you know, even our MOAs can help to distribute kits and, and go through some of the education as well as our community health nurses. So I, I think that um, helps to improve some of that, those access because, you know, there's some people who still feel very uncomfortable with physicians, um, e even me. Um, and so there's community members that I've that I don't know that that don't want to come and see me, and um, and so they should still have access to these services. Um, and you know, I I think um, kind of coming back to the uh, those feelings of shame or inadequacy, and and part of um, uh, the colonial process is also that Indigenous people often feel like they're not as qualified, that they don't know as much, um, and so you know, kind of educating people that you know, they can do this, they could do a self collection if, if that is what they wanted to, or if that's what they would prefer to do to help kind of um, inf enforce those messages. Because um, oftentimes I come up and women feel very um, insecure, they don't trust that they're, they're able to do it. And so um, I think that that's, yeah, that, that's another <laughs> way that we can help empower and to address some of those colonial messaging. Um, let me see. Um, yeah, I guess um, the last thing I'll, I'll end with uh, is, you know, for me, you know, I think that it's always really important to come back to that, you know, the impacts of colonial um, colonization and, and ongoing colonialism because it impacts access. Um, it also impacts um, our um, the, the amount of morbidity and mortality in our communities, um, the trauma um, effects on our bodies, um, that these can have deadly consequences. And when we look at Indigenous women, um, we can be disproportionately affected. Uh, on May 5th, um, you know, it was, uh, it was a national day of remembering of a missing, murdered Indigenous women. And that, you know, that that's part of the this continuum of the devastating effects. And for me, um, in particular to cervical cancer screening, um, one case that, you know, always have a lasting impression on me is a young woman in her 20s who was diagnosed with invasive cervical cancer while she was pregnant with her fourth child. And over the course of the next 18 months, um, did eventually succumb to, to the disease because she was so heavily traumatized that she couldn't, that she never could bring herself to have a pap. Um, and, you know, in uh, sitting with her and talking with her, you know, she just said there was no other way. There was no way that she was going to be able to do that. 
And so I do think it's just important to note that, um, yeah, that, that these, uh, that the impact of this, the impact of having a 92% higher incidence is that um, it makes it so that we lose um, our community members and our family members sooner. Um, and now, you know, four children grow up without their mom. Thanks. Thank you, Terry, for sharing your, your experiences and your perspective for being such a great advocate for this work. Um, so we'll take a pause here and I don't know, Cole, if there's any questions uh, specific to, to this work with Carrie Sikeni. Sorry, I just have to take a moment to um, gather myself. That was such a powerful story. Um, and you know, the part of it that, oh, that is a, it's a devastating story. And I think that part of it that is really upsetting to me is that it's, it's that, like you said, we just had a, a national day commemorating the ongoing violence against indigenous women in this country. And this is a direct impact of that. And, and it just highlights the importance of this session and I, I will compose myself and carry on. I apologize. Um, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that. Mary. So we had a question come in. Uh, I assume it's from a, a younger um, individual and they just wanted to know when would be a good time for them to start screening? I assume that as we can, you know, with this availability of the, uh, with the availability of this project in the North, um, perhaps the opportunities will come earlier for individuals. So when would you, um, would you all kind of collectively recommend that someone start screening or start getting, uh, you know, participating in the self-screening project? Uh, so again, these are still, um, you know, pilot projects uh, that we're, you know, hoping to to scale up, which I'll touch on on later. Uh, but currently, depending what province you live in, there's slightly different guidelines. Um, and at the end of the presentation, we're we're also going to have provide some links to resources about uh, about those guidelines. So currently, uh, the standard of care in British Columbia is is screening with with Pap smears, um, and that starts at um, age 25. Um, or uh, three years after the onset of sexual activity, whichever is later. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I just had a, a question that kind of came to my mind as well. And, and I noticed, I believe in the slides that you showed us a little earlier, Ali, that the conversation around the self-screening project started with Carrier Sikani in 2017, is that correct? And yeah. Shona, uh, sorry, Dr. Mitchell Foster, you mentioned that there were pilot projects before this that were out in Ontario that we were talking about self-screening. Is that correct or was I misinterpreting that piece? Yeah, so, so self-screening is something that um, there's growing, you know, a huge amount of evidence on now. So, um, you know, Gina Ogilvy, who's um, logged in right now as well, um, and um, myself and a, a larger team have been involved in, for example, in a project in Uganda using self-screening, uh, huge cohorts in uh, European countries, um, and uh, some European countries are, have already integrated self-screening into aspects of their uh, national screening programs as well. Um, so, um, yeah, absolutely, lots of, lots of evidence um, on, on self-screening as an option, absolutely. Fantastic. So I guess my question is in your, in, in all, I'd love to hear from each of you in your opinions, why, why is this, why is this a pilot project for in North now? It, it seems to me as though that this, this sort of, you know, the capacity or maybe not the capacity, but the opportunity to have self-screening programs has been around for a while and we've chatted a little bit today in this session about the dearth of data and, and the lack of support that we all are aware of for indigenous women in accessing this screening uh, so i guess so my question is and it's not to tear you down absolutely not i think the the, the work that's being done now is amazing but i guess my question is what why, why why did it take so long i can kind of have a start with that and maybe hand it over to shown afterwards um I actually wasn't involved in the very, very early days when when things were cut, discussions were started. I joined in in 
2019, but from my understanding of what made this project a success from the start was the building of relationships and trust. And these are things that don't happen overnight. And, you know, we can have a really clear understanding of um, need for alternative screening, but um, it's, it's not going to be successful if um, you just get into the into communities as a stranger and say, hey, we've got this alternative to screening. It's um, so much of the lead up to the success of this work is the, the relationship building is being a familiar face and name to community members, um, as well as just ironing out different processes and um, working with so, so many people um, and just yeah, developing pathways where, where all of these partners and community members um, are in agreement with approaches. So that's kind of my response to that, but I don't know, Shona or others, if you want to, to add on. Yeah, I, you know, absolutely. Thanks, Ali, for talking at the, the engagement, um, engagement and partnership takes, takes a really long, long time. And you kind of have to have the right combination of, uh, you have to have funding um, and one of the challenges in BC specifically is actually that our screening programs historically are almost too good. Like we're a victim of our own success. So in British Columbia, so for example, compared to Ontario, um, we have a, a very centralized um, uh, program for, for analyzing our pap smears. So it's completely centralized. Um, whereas in Ontario, it's, you know, each region is different. And so because of that, the quality is very high. And there's been a lot of infrastructure, a lot of funds put into developing an excellent provincial screening program. And partly because of that, um, sometimes, you know, change is hard, especially on a provincial level. Uh, it's a massive undertaking and has impacts for follow up as well. So if there is an abnormal screening test, the follow-up is quite different if you're using HPV or if you're using PAPS. And that has impacts on, on the specialists involved in those services as well. Um, so, but part of it is because we have an excellent provincial screening program. And one of the very fascinating things about the impact of, of the pandemic right now is that we are so far behind on PAPS, we might not be able to catch up. And that's actually causing this impetus to push towards primary screening with HPV. Um, and as Dr. Ogilvie, who's on the call and others will attest to, we've been trying for a decade to, to move towards that provincially. Um, so it's it really unique opportunities uh, right now. And, and we're thrilled that, um, you know, this, this continues to move forward and there's like more and more knowledge around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Did anybody else have anything they wanted to add to that piece or? I'm going to take the, I'm going to take the silence as a no. Thanks, Allie and, and Shona very much for that. I, I appreciate the response. Absolutely. The, the emphasis on relationship is always going to make these processes, you know, take a little bit longer to set up and I can appreciate that. And it's interesting to note the, that the, in some ways, the success of our provincial screening program may have been hindering the availability of this beforehand. You know, it's, yeah, it's, 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 uh, Good and bad, you know what I mean? So um, that's an interesting perspective. Thank you both very much. Um, we did actually have a question come in while you were uh, answering Dr. Mitchell Foster. What are the next steps for individuals who have positive or abnormal results? Are there community outreach initiatives for the next step if you're doing the HPV screening like we were just talking about or do individuals need to follow up with a physician, excuse me, in a larger center? Like Prince George, for example. Shona, do you want me to? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, no, that's a great question. And um, I think it's a, a crucial part of this work is that um, the initial step of doing HPV self collection is great and really important. Um, and we get a lot of enthusiasm around it, but this that piece wouldn't be doing its job if we didn't do any required follow up afterwards. So the follow up piece is super important and something that um, our team um, really prioritize, prioritizes supporting. So um, depending on the result, there might be a need to have a follow-up PAP test um, or alternative, alternatively, there might be a need for a colposcopy appointment um, and that takes place in Prince George for the most part. There are a few other um, 
colposcopy clinics in the north, but um, that's a huge part of, of as a project assistant, um, and I can speak on behalf of Katina as well, where we step in and, and really ensure that that follow-up care is being followed through. Um, and there's some really great resources in place uh, to help with patient travel if people do need to travel outside of communities. Um, but in terms of the Carrie Sakani project, um, PAP tests can be done for the most part directly in communities, but we're, we're always working with um, the thought in mind that we wanna make sure people are comfortable. So um, we you know, work with clinicians and, and staff to make sure that uh, the participant is comfortable with whatever physician they're doing follow-up care with. Awesome. Thanks very much. Yeah, it, of course, it makes sense, right, if we're going to be trying to create a, a more culturally safe and just generally safer pl uh, place for Indigenous women or Indigenous people with a cervix to, to come in and access this care, then of course, it's got to be, you know, it doesn't make sense to make one part of that of that journey better and then kind of ignore the rest. So it's great to hear that emphasis coming from the project on making sure that the individual is safe and supported throughout the process, you know, whatever the, the results of their tests are. I think we'll probably move on now um, and we'll get a few more questions. We'll try and address them at the end. Thanks okay. everyone. Sounds great. So last but not least, uh, the third self-collection project in the North that works in partnership with the First Nations Health Authority, uh, which is a province-wide health authority offering self, um, sorry, offering culturally safe uh, health and wellness services to Indigenous people. Uh, so with this project, we partner with three communities, uh, which include Port Nelson First Nation, Westmore Relief First Nation, and Soto First Nation. So in 2017, discussions began with multiple partners, organizations, and communities. Um, there was a lot of interest and support for this work, and an application for funds was made and successful. And then uh, in 2018, the three partnering communities were identified, and um, this was based heavily on geographic location. In 2019, our team worked with representatives from the First Nations Health Authority, local health teams, and community members to develop the project process and materials. Um, and then just recently, in early 2021, we officially launched the project in two of the three communities, and we are hopeful that the third will be getting started shortly. And I'm actually going to pass it over to Shona now to outline um, some of the key points and learnings from this project. So one of the things that's been fascinating with all these different projects is, is really how diverse they've been and uh, how we've um, had to adjust the process uh, because of that. And I think a lot of times um, within our research systems and even just around you know, health systems and project implementation, the focus is on let's find like the that the answer, let's find like the one way that we can do things that's gonna work. Like that's what we want. And that's where all this, you know, a huge amount of funding goes to. And in a lot of ways, these projects are exactly the opposite. And we've started calling it precision implementation um, in that we're actually scaling down. We're actually figuring out how, how each way that is implemented, each way the community rollout is gonna happen is actually different. Um, and so obviously we're using the, the same technology. So the same self-screening intervention, uh, but the way that's accessed um, and also how we monitor the projects um, it has all been different. And some of the unique aspects with the uh, partnership with, with FNHA is, is partly around, um, so the funding uh, for it was not research funding. Uh, so it wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't tied to CHR reporting or anything like that. It was uh, 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 foundation funding. And um, because of that, the idea was to do more of a, like a project implementation. So um, a rollout. And um, there was a, a lot of discussion around how, how is this different? Is it research? Is it not? And part of that was figuring out what information communities wanted, but also what, um, what FNHA wanted at a regional level. So what type of, you know, institutional or organizational knowledge do we want to create to be able to um, inform future projects? So the lens on it was quite, uh, quite different um, in the rollout. And that's part of, of uh, why the timeline was um, really um, quite different than, than the uh, kind of the more um, 
I want to say conventional research uh, funding approach. Um, and so there was a lot of back and forth um, with this. Um, it was really thrilling to be, um, you know, hearing about the, the regional caucus. So after it was kind of brought forward at the like regional executive level, going to the regional caucus and hearing about how excited communities were to participate and then the disappointment when only three of them were were selected, so that you know that that level is um, it's it's always encouraging and, and really um, brings a whole a new level of kind of responsibility or accountability um, to to us as as a team as well. Um, and um, one of the other ways it was different as well is that there was very specific requests for it not being solely. Um, you know, cervical cancer screening, but also integrating um, a screening for other STIs, and also including discussions around uh, around men and their access to screening um, as a priority for uh, for FNHA. Um, and those were excellent discussions to have. Um, and it took a lot of looking at the um, health system infrastructures and where all those things overlap. And certainly, those are areas that. Um, we're, we're still working on and figuring out how we can bolster more, um, a bit more of a holistic kind of uh, more of a like reproductive or sexual health approaches and, and really facilitate, um, you know, building kind of laying the pathway with the uh, cervical cancer screening and be able to kind of add additional uh, services onto that. So in that way, it's really been, um, you know, been a, been very unique. Um, and um, the, the priorities at a community level and what um, at an FNHA level, kind of what, what they're looking for um, has, has been some very kind of robust discussions um, around that. Um, and so I'll get the, um, the next slide. So um, the, um, the thing, you know, I, I mentioned it before that we're part of this larger provincial um, uh, research group uh, and very focused on uh, cervical cancer elimination. Um, and again, even saying that we're gonna eliminate a, a type of cancer is, is unique um, and it's thrilling and a really exciting time to be, be part of this, uh, this team. Um, and so we do, obviously, these projects are ongoing. Um, there is um, a plan to, um, so one of the most common questions that, that we get as a team is, is why can't, you know, why can't everyone get this? Like, why are you, why are you limiting it? Um, and I know Katina's had a lot of those questions around um, Métis Nation as well, um, that, that she is, um, incredible incredibly professional in how she responds to those um, but we are expanding you know the plan is to expand to um, additional Métis communities um, in the north which we're excited about uh, we're also you know continuing with the um, carrier Sikani program uh, provincially there's also um, a cervix check Fraser program um, in Surrey more of a focus on uh, immigrant women and, and people with cervixes um, and the, um, you know, provincially there, there's um, a larger rollout of um, uh, self-screening to, to a variety of different underscreened populations um, at a much higher level. So we're, you know, we kind of feel that just the momentum's continuing, um, continuing to build. Um, and part of those uh, programs are also uh, related to um, vaccine confidence um, and uh, kind of a, a whole, the whole kind of bigger picture of how we can work towards um, uh, the elimination of, of cervical cancer in BC and really be a model um, nationally, if not globally. And um, again, uh, Dr. Gina Ogilvie is um, the one who's leading up that um, exciting, exciting project. Um, next slide. So we do have, I, I mentioned a couple of these resources uh, during the presentation. Um, so a link to Marion's um, uh, story, um, the FNHA uh, BC cancer um, video, um, and a lot of just other, um, other resources um, that you may find um, useful um, uh, are available there. Next slide. And uh, we really want to, um, you know, as a team, um, we are so deeply grateful 
um, and feel um, a profound privilege to, to be able to engage with communities with this uh, project. Um, it's, it's incredible. Um, it's very rewarding work. Um, you, can, you can see the timelines are long. And we wanted to, to, to try to give you an idea of how many people were actually involved in, um, in getting this off the ground. And, you know, we've absolutely, this, is, this list is not comprehensive, um, but it takes a, a huge amount, um, a huge amount of people um, to, uh, to make this happen, both in individual communities and at um, organizational and, and the provincial level. Uh, so even at the, you know, the uh, provincial lab, uh, level. So, um, yeah, thank you for, for letting us uh, share today. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd love to leave a bit of time here for, for further questions as well. Awesome. Thanks so much, everybody. That, that was really, really informative. I feel like I've learned a whole lot. We're going to transition to a few more questions that we have left over um, that just kind of uh, we didn't get the chance to address uh, throughout the presentation. So one of the first questions still kind of left to it just in the spirit of kind of continuing to improve. And I appreciate that one of those last slides there, uh, Dr. Mitchell Foster, we highlighted where the pro program is going for the future, because that was one of my next questions was kind of how, how are we going to take this work forward? But um, one of the questions that came in was, uh, was around barriers that, that still exist. Uh, what do you guys see or, or how do you, what do you guys see as being the, the biggest barriers that still exist, you know, even with the HPV sampling um, project that we've, that we've rolled or that you've rolled out here and how are you working to kind of address those? How is it working to kind of continue to improve um, that project? Would it just be access for communities? Um, would you like to expand the access out more or, or kind of what are your thoughts? Um, can I just, I just want to touch on that. So um, I think one of the barriers that I, that I see is a lack of Indigenous women in health care positions. Um, and uh, part of my work at the Health Arts Research Centre is uh, dealing with that, but also in my master's thesis I've been working towards um, increasing Indigenous women's uh, uh, role in, in women's health uh, and community health. So um, for my master's thesis, I'm using um, action research to create a curriculum for um, birth workers um, so that we can have um, uh, uh, birth workers trained um, who might go on to become nurses, who might go on to become midwives, kind of like a sort of like a skills training, but for the community that is culturally informed. Um, so I, I know that for a lot, for myself, the way that I started my journey as a researcher was I went home for a while and I was a traditional knowledge researcher for about a year. Um, and I like to call that my urban indigenous rehabilitation program because I learned so much about my culture in, in, in a really short time frame. Um, but, um, that's kind of my, my feeling is that um, in order to for people to have success in in the the really colonial environments of inst institutions where people go to learn like um, UNBC or UBC midwifery program or um, Thompson Rivers University or anywhere um, people would have a lot more success if they are grounded in culture in a, a cultural understanding before they go. Um, so that's kind of the work that I, that I'm hoping to, that I am doing now, actually, um, and I'm hoping to get the curriculum developed by May of 2022 um, during my defense. So yeah, I think that, that having more Indigenous women in healthcare is, is certainly um, a barrier, uh, but also it's something that um, I know a lot of people are working on, including our office here at the Health Arts Research Center and uh, and um, uh, the other organizations that were mentioned in this presentation as well. Great, thanks, Marion. Yeah, for sure. I think that's a that's a a very big kind of systemic thing that uh, that we need to change that we need to continue to work towards. And I know there's great work that's happening all over the place and trying to 
trying to address this issue of, of having Indigenous women be represented and involved in healthcare, you know, at every kind of point of the journey, let's say, for, for an Indigenous woman or a person with a cervix that's entering the system. So yeah, couldn't agree more. It's a great point. One of the, um, you know, the, the other things is the looking at the cascade of, of care. So um, this is covered a bit in a previous question, but, um, you know, we know from, you know, this study and others that women are, are thrilled to participate. So we tend to have uh, really high, you know, very keen to do that initial screening, but um, also critical is that if you have a positive screen is the, the follow-up that's required at each step. And that may just, depending on the type of HPV you have, it may just be a pap that, you know, Dr. Terry will do for you um, in Notley. But if it's a high-risk type of HPV, that does mean traveling to a regional center for, for colposcopy. Um, and even having that specialized services available um, across the North uh, within a reasonable distance to, to women um, is an incredible, like that is a real challenge for us right now in the North <laughs> to make sure that that women don't have to, to travel those long distances. Um, so it's, it's absolutely like in no way is this like an easy fix. Uh, this is a step in the right direction. Um, and uh, ideally, it, it enables a discussion around, uh, you know, women being able to engage in, in their own health and wellness and, um, you know, take more, more control, take back control um, of, of the screening, but um, absolutely lots, lots of challenges. Um, you know, Ali could tell you stories and stories about uh, tracking specimens <laughs> and you know, oh yeah, like they they collected. Oh, it's been a few weeks. Where's the specimen? And uh, you know, it's you know stuck in a post office, or you know, like there's so many, um, you know, so many factors. Um, I mean, fortunately, that one was an easy fix. We just had to go visit the post office and take some donuts, and we figured it out. But um, yeah, it's it's definitely not straightforward, and and again, reflected in just the sheer number of people that are involved. Um, in, in getting this off the ground and, and keeping it moving forward. The untold stories of health champions, donuts and post office workers. <laughs> Someone's got to do it. Like Someone's I'll, I'll step it. up for the. <laughs> Absolutely. Did anyone else have anything they wanted to add to that question or should we move on? Okay. So you mentioned that, um, that when initially we were you kind of you know you kind of brought it to communities and chatted about it there was a lot of um there was a lot of excitement about the the opportunity for for this to exist um and particularly in the north obviously we're talking about there's there's layers of issues in terms of access to this sort of care right for for the north um what is i guess what is the timeline for for the pilot and um for you know for what, what we're doing now the time the timeline for the pilot project and I suppose when the question could be could be phrased as like when would uh, when would this kind of service become more widely available or more like heavily available within not just the north but in in BC but beyond you know into other provinces we had a particular question around um, communities in the plains um, uh, like in Alberta and Saskatchewan and stuff Métis communities out there did you guys have any thoughts about that are we looking essentially are we looking to use this project as as really a beacon of how effective this model can be for Indigenous communities and then build off of it moving forward from there? Or what are your guys' thoughts on that? Um, I just wanted to, um, one thing that I noticed about initiatives that are done for the greater good of Indigenous women in BC is that it ends up being good for all women. So like for one thing, the cell phone service on the Highway of Tears, though great for Indigenous women, um, it's great for all rural women within there. So I'm looking forward to seeing if this can have more success for a lot of our rural women who, who aren't Indigenous. Um, so I think that like even just sticking to BC, there's still a lot of work to be done. I think that's the golden question that we ask ourselves <laughs> a lot. Um, and I think that so we've touched on that a little bit, but there is lots of progress happening to to make that a reality for for all um, populations to have access to this. I just wanted to add one piece to that. Currently, um, with the Métis Nation project and Carrie Sukani, we have 
exit surveys. So um, participants can choose to participate in a survey where they can give feedback um, and just give some information about preferences for screening and what might be things that could be done better. Um, so that's really valuable information that's going to help to inform future work down the road as well. So. And I would say that it is like it's it's rolling out we're we're in the process of, of rolling out the larger um, pilot uh, program, which is going to be thousands and thousands of women. So it's it's happening. This is real, you know, in in the you know, within the next year, this is this is going to be scaling up. And um, again, like right now, they're putting the business plan together for, uh, you know, transitioning to. Uh, primary screening with, you know, updating the, the business plan for switching to primary screening with HPV with the self-screening being a much uh, larger part of it uh, provincially. So, um, you know, I, I love what Marion said about, you know, this, you know, improving uh, care for Indigenous women is actually improving care for, for everyone. Um, and that's absolutely, um, absolutely the case. Fantastic. Yeah, I think, um, you know, if, if I could say anything, it would be, you know, so much of the questions that have come in today are talking about, you know, when can I see this in my community? When can we see this in this province? And I think it, if nothing else, that's a, that's a testament to how important the work is and how keen women are, not just in Northern BC, but across, you know, across the country, across Turtle Island, all of our communities and in, in seeing these sorts of options become available for them. So Kudos to, to all of you. Thank you so, so much for your time here today. I really appreciated the opportunity to learn from you. Um, I'm just gonna do our little learning circle outro now. If you have any other last minute questions for anyone that's gathered here, please put them in the Q&A function or the chat box uh, and we'll get, to, uh, we'll get to them in a moment. Uh, learning circle coming up for the rest of the summer on May 20th, we're gonna have an event um, on the alcohol harm prevention, um, harm reduction, sorry. Um, uh, there's a project that's happening um, out on the island. So we're really excited to highlight that piece. There'll be more information on our Learning Circle website very shortly. Um, and, and then into June, we're going to be partnering uh, with the FNHA on a few sessions regarding uh, Indigenous women in sports um, and uh, recreation and that sort of thing and the impacts on health and well-being. So stay tuned for more information on those pieces. They should be coming out very shortly. Uh, I'm just going to give the Q&A function one last little look-see. I think we got through to most of the questions that we had here today. So uh, I'll just, um, I'll end it there. Thank you so very much again, everyone, for, for coming and participating. Um, Ali, Shona, Terry, Katina, Marion, thank you very much for your time and your perspective here today. If you had anything you wanted to, to leave the audience with, I, I invite you to take that space now. I, assume, I, just want to, I just want to add that the Health Arts Research Center um, currently has some um, applications opened for our summer science. We decided that this year that um, Indigenous Youth Summer Science is going to be moving um, into communities as opposed to um, the way that it was done previously where we would bring everybody to UNBC and do summer science. Now it's going to be the communities themselves running summer science. So if your community is interested, um, go to um, healtharts.ca and look for the um, information with regards to summer science. You can also check us out on Facebook. Um, so yeah, that's a it's a, a grant that's opening up. Awesome. And then the resources that we've chatted about today will be available in your resource package after the after the session. So thanks very much again, everyone, um, and have a great day. Take care. Bye.